My name's Simon Goddard and I lead an organization called Rivertree, uh, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about later. But just over 10 years ago, when I was a minister of Low Chapel, a small rural congregation just outside Cambridge, I put up on the screen a picture of a crossroads because over a series of church meetings, we as a church community, we're gonna make an important decision. We were gonna choose between two paths, a path of familiarity and comfort, or a path of obedience and faithfulness into the unknown, uh, into a place that God was calling us. Over the previous few years, we'd started a fresh expression of church one Sunday each month, a family-friendly uh, cafe, uh, kids' church type activity uh, that, and that it had enabled us to engage with a number of new families uh, where people were engaging with the gospel and on journeys of faith. And the church had cancelled one of their Sunday morning services in the chapel in order to resource that fresh expression of church. But now we faced a significant decision. As leaders, we felt God was calling us to move all of our Sunday morning services into that space, the school uh, in the village uh, down the road. Interestingly, though, the next year, 2010, was going to be our bicentenary, 200 years uh, since the chapel was founded, and we were suggesting to the church that our celebration of that 200 years should be marked by us leaving the building on a Sunday morning, an interesting uh, series of meetings. People uh, were grieved by the possibility of leaving their chapel, one person in tears as she spoke. But over those series of meetings, over a number of weeks, uh, something remarkable, something miraculous happened people came to a point where unanimously at the end of those meetings, we were able to vote that we were going to leave the building and set up each Sunday at the school. It was amazing. People said, it's not what I want, but it's clear that this is what God wants. A remarkable moment in the journey of that church. It's a remarkable moment in the journey of any church when we realize that the heart of our faith is the death and resurrection of Jesus. John 12, 24 says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed, but if it does fall to the ground and die, it becomes a harvest of 30, 60, or 100 fold. The path of faithfulness is one that needs us to embrace death. It's a path that enables us through death to find life. In Jeremiah 6, you read a warning to the people of Jerusalem, the people of Israel. Yes, we get to verse 16, where we're encouraged to take the path, the ancient path, the good path. But this verse 16 is set in the context of a warning. A warning to the people of Jerusalem about their behavior, about the way they had acted, the way that they showed little fruit. In verse nine, we read of the possibility of the enemies of Israel's coming upon them and gleaning whatever remnant may remain on them like one who gleans from the vine. And I believe that that warning could be one that is being spoken over the church today. In this COVID season where the church is challenged, where the church is facing uh, a number of difficulties and challenges, we also face a missional opportunity. We also face a choice of which path we are going to take. Do we take the comfortable and familiar path or do we take the path that takes us down a road that we're yet to understand or see fully? Do we take the path of faithfulness? In Hebrews 12, we read of God's people, the ancients who are commended for their faithfulness. When I was a regional minister, some people in uh, churches would say to me, at least we're being faithful. The church in this nation is in a context of decline. In 1979, 12% of the population on any given Sunday would find themselves in church. That figure today is less than 6%. And if you look at people in their 20s, that figure is 3% or less. I believe just as 
Jerusalem faced the words of the prophet warning them uh, about the place where they were in their relationship with God. I believe uh, that warning is one perhaps we need to hear as church. Each generation receives from the generation previous to it something to hand on to the next generation. And this generation is, in a number of ways, unique. In terms of the economy, we heard even before uh, COVID that the state of the economy, both in our wealth as a nation and in our equality, is worse than it's been uh, for previous generations. Children are going to struggle to buy their own homes. Inequality hinders our uh, flourishing as a nation. The previous generation is handing less on uh, to the next generation. But the same is true also of the planet. Previous generations have inherited an earth uh, and this generation is passing to its children a planet which is in a worse state than they received it in. Young people are despairing at what we have done to this planet. But what about the church? I believe this generation is also handing the church in a poorer state to the next generation. This warning that Jeremiah offered to the people of Jerusalem uh, is a warning for us as a church. Have we uh, held church for ourselves? Have we made the path uh, one of familiarity and comfort rather than of faithfulness and fruitfulness? I believe uh, the, the path of faithfulness always leads to the destination of fruitfulness. That if we are being faithful, it says in John 15, verse 16, that I've appointed you for fruitfulness. I've chosen you for that purpose. Uh, and it says, if you abide in me, if you uh, live in me and in my will uh, for you, you will be fruitful. It says that in John 15. And I believe always the path of faithfulness leads uh, to fruit. I believe the church is being challenged now about what it does moving forward. Is it going to be a generation that hands the vine on uh, in an almost barren state? Or is it going to be a generation in the church that allows God to prune it in order that the next generation would be fruitful? In the past, there have been seasons of renewal in the church. The ministry of Wesley and Whitfield, people like St. Francis, who particularly inspires me, the ministry of the Clapham sect. At times in our history, people have looked at the state of the church and rather than just praying for revival, and yes, let us pray for revival, but rather than just praying for revival, they have understood that renewal is necessary. These renewal movements in the church have embraced the new thing that God is doing, have understood what God is asking of them in their generation and have acted in obedience. So the question is, what will the legacy be of the generation in church at the moment? This COVID season gives us an opportunity to pause, to reset, to ask the question, what does God want of us moving forward and to respond to it? Is this going to be a season where we allow God to prune in order that the legacy of this generation is going to be one of fruitfulness for generations to come? I mentioned Rivertree, which is the organisation I set up when I left regional ministry a couple of years ago. I left it in my own uh, uh, journey of faithfulness, my own path of obedience. In order to fulfill the calling upon my life, I felt I needed to leave regional ministry and set up uh, Rivertree. And I'm going to tell you a bit more uh, about it. But one of the things that I'm being inspired to do at the moment through Rivertree is to invite collaboration around a new form of church. Transform.church seeks to uh, nurture and cultivate relationships in four dimensions. And I think each of these four dimensions is vital for the church moving forward uh, in this generation. The first is, of course, our relationship with God. 
the dimension, the spiritual dimension is of utter importance, ultimate importance. Is this going to be a generation that takes seriously its relationship with God, its obedience to the call of God, its confidence in the gospel uh, and its sharing of what we've got, what we have found in the person of Jesus? We need to be a church that takes seriously that relationship, that dimension and finds fruitfulness uh, in that. But we also need to be a generation that engages and develops our relationship with others. So often church focuses on one of these dimensions and ignores the rest. Uh, we need to look at the issues of injustice in our world. We need to be engaging in our communities, bearing their pain and then through the gift of the Holy Spirit, dreaming with them about what could be possible when God's kingdom comes amongst them. We need to be people who engage socially, who have a voice in the public square, addressing the issues of our age and being active in them. We also need to develop a third relationship, relationship with the natural world, with God's creation, with stuff. In previous uh, generations, we have embraced uh, the, the lie uh, that our wealth is found in things, that our satisfaction is found through consuming. That isn't the case. We need to be a generation that takes seriously our relationship with the world, takes seriously the issues of climate change, takes seriously the challenge to live simply, uh, to value the things which money can't buy, peace and hope and covenant and joy. We need to be people who take seriously uh, our relationship with the created world, who engage and lead in a movement that seeks to protect and hand on in a better manner than we are at the moment, this planet that we have been given. And a fourth relationship I think is vital as well, to see transformation in the inner person, to be committed to personal growth, personal discipleship, uh, to fruitfulness in our character and courage in our calling. Each of us asking that question uh, of what God requires of us and then boldly going uh, in that direction, trusting in God. We're called to be a church of transformation, seeing people's relationships with God transformed, relationships with one another transformed, relationship with this world transformed relationships with ourselves and the calling upon our lives transformed. If that inspires you, I'm keen to talk to you and to collaborate with you in transform.church. Rivertree seeks to catalyze and to cultivate and to collaborate. Over the last two years, uh, a, a team is growing of contractors and collaborators that work with me to enable others to fulfill uh, God's calling on their lives, to fulfill individual and organisational callings uh, to be obedient to God. We've collaborated in a number of ways. We have Fresh Expressions where we provide resourcing uh, for uh, those who are seeking uh, to start new expressions of church. Download the God Send app, which is just one of the resources that we've been instrumental uh, in providing. Look up FX Godsend in the App Store or Google Play. We've also been collaborating with Baptists Together. I'm one of the three pioneer ambassadors alongside Roy Sell and Ali Bolton, but I've also been involved in a project called Missional Adventure, compiling a hundred stories seeking to inspire uh, others to engage on the adventure that God has in store uh, for them. And we're currently talking uh, with Baptists together about collaborating on a new project, embracing the kickstart missional opportunity uh, that uh, the government is uh, funding in terms of a new generation employability uh, skills. Uh, but this is an opportunity for churches to invest in the lives of young people. We're collaborating uh, with others. I collaborate with the Eastern Baptist Association uh, enabling mission in the east of England. I collaborate with the Light College uh, uh, through Ritchery. We were part of the Hope Bringers course, seeking to encourage people to creatively share uh, the gospel. Collaborating uh, with dioceses, 
uh, uh, particularly in Ipswich at the moment, and with individual churches, Baptist churches, journeying with them uh, to explore what God is calling them to be uh, and to become in terms of missional engagement. Also uh, collaborated recently with uh, the Transforming Shame Group to offer a, a conference attended by more than 100 people on shame and the gospel. And finally, we're exploring a collaboration uh, with Fresh Dreams uh, about offering training in 5Q and hopefully uh, you'll hear about that elsewhere in this conference. We seek to catalyze, we seek to initiate and sow seeds of innovation across the church, uh, encouraging new things to emerge. We seek to cultivate, we are passionate about pursuing fruitfulness for individuals and organizations to become all they were created to be. And we realize that none of that is possible without collaboration, working together for the sake of the gospel. I'd love for you to be one of those who take the ancient path, that path that the ancients were commended for, that path of faithfulness. Because that path of faithfulness is a path that leads to fruitfulness, into the place that God has prepared for us, uh, into that place that God has in store for us, that place of obedience for this generation, uh, for this time, a path of life and legacy, a path of faithfulness and fruitfulness. I pray that you too might find that ancient path one of fruitfulness and joy. Amen.